good evening everyone it's my pleasure to welcome you all to world human sciences management conference 2021 this is rudra narayan das executive director center for adivasi research and development welcomes you we are proud to announce that this conference is conducted along with indian institute of management sambalpur central university of odisha koraput and revenso university katak odisha i welcome our guest speaker for today professor amir r mufti and participants across the globe through facebook and youtube live and who are here to listen professor mufti the broader theme of this conference is ethnological context disciplinary practices of social sciences and policy frames on behalf of center of adivasi research and development i extend my profound gratitude to professor dr sanjay kumar nayak respected vice chancellor revenso university katak professor dr mahadev joyswal respected director indian institute of management professor dr sharad kumar palita vice chancellor central university of odisha the convener of this largest virtual conference our eminent indian historian professor chandi prasad nanda and eminent policy activist writer and philanthropist mr charudat panigrahi ji dear friends the main outcome of this conference is to come up with the national and international framework for the education system in future the crux of this conference will be the use of digital technologies such as artificial intelligence argumented reality and virtual virtual reality that is being increasingly adopted after the outbreak of covid-19 we hope this conference would help students faculties researchers and all to expand their mental horizon and help the education system to adopt the best ladies and gentlemen the center of adivasi research and development is a leading research oriented institution promoting ethnographic empirical and evidence based research for engaging and addressing the challenges that 21st century globe is facing today the prime agenda of this institution is to come up with potential policy solutions for social change while believing in the idea of debate dialogue and discussion and with expertise is experiencing in education the institution focuses on marginalized communities and work for their livelihood to protect the nature culture language and identity in particular the age of modernity has witnessed that change is the only constant phenomena for societal purpose to enhance knowledge our information work for them is methodical and avoid paradoxically frameworks which is neglected so many centuries from theory to become practice the center sincerely believes in the concept of social marketing which is seriously looking for the non profit marketing and build new social entrepreneurship for check and balance mechanism to glorify the generations to come the center uh, and uh, center of adivasi research and development come to start with the holistic approach of critical thinking in education uh, to fill the gaps and to plan accordingly for the voiceless communities dear friends in this evening we have with us professor amir r mufti professor mufti is born and raised in karachi pakistan and he currently uh, serves as a prof- as a professor of comparative literature in U- ucla he did his phd in comparative literature at columbia and edward said he have been trained in two disciplines literary studies and anthropology as well as south asian middle eastern north african and jewish studies and his scholarship reflects this range of disciplinary ways of thinking above all professor mufti is a student of european colonialism decolonization as a worldwide process and the culture and politics of the post colonial world in this context the bulk of his work has engaged with the legacies of of the british empire especially in the indian subcontinent but he is also interested in french colonialism in north uh, in north africa and its legacies for the uh, immigration debates in france how the figure of migrant impra- impacts the project of european unification is one of his main uh, preoccupations at the moment in a book uh, in a book project called strangers in europe recently he have also 
turn to Palestine as historical experience, the experience of the missing homeland and its significance for the critical humanities. His writings have been a series of attempts to rethink some fundamental concept of categories of Western humanities, the secular, the minor, the cosmopolitan, the exilic, the border, migrant and refuge, the, the anglophone also, the world from the perspective of colonized and post-colonial society and populations. He is a long time member of the editorial collective and of the journal Boundary 2 and have edited several uh, of its uh, special collections. Uh, Professor Mufti's first book, Enlightenment in, uh, in the Colony, The Jewish Question and the Crisis of Post-Colonial Culture, uh, released in 2007 in Princeton, he argued in his book that the so-called Jewish question of the so long 19th century in Western Europe established the paradigm of minority experience uh, in modernity, a paradigm decimated to the colonial world through the establishment of nationalism and the nation states as the normative political ideology and state from the modern world. The, uh, the so-called Muslim question in South uh, Asia thus marks uh, for uh, him a colonial and post-colonial reworking for metropolitan, paradig uh, metropolitan paradigm. His second book, Forgot English, Orientalisms and World Literatures in Harvard University Press, Press in 2016, argues that world literature as a concept and as a horizon of possibility is historically linked to the revolution in humanistic practice that said, uh, that said called uh, Orientalism and that is contemporary forms uh, replicate some of those cultural logics and categories. Hiding inside world literature, he argues, uh, is the dominance of globalized English, whose own history leads us back to the uh, emergent Orientalism of the late 18th century. And its role is in reshaping the European human humanities and world of letters more broadly. World literature is a, a discourse of mobility of literary works, authors, genes, uh, forms, styles, and so on. But uh, its existing forms, its discourse has only uh, become possible to suppressing the realities of uh, enforced forms of uh, immobility. Professor Mufti will deliver his talk uh, in uh, today's uh, symposia, the norms of world literature. Now, without uh, taking much time, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, uh, Srinivasulu Enes to go for an opening remark. Uh, for uh, Professor Mufti. Over to you, Professor Srinivasan. Thank you, Rupanarayan Dash, the Executive uh, Director of uh, the Center for Adivasi Research and Development. While acknowledging the contribution made by all the office uh, bearers of uh, the Center for Adivasi Research and Development uh, in organizing uh, this kind of global level conferences since uh, past two years, I would like to uh, once again welcome uh, Professor Mukti from Karachi. And uh, I uh, would like to uh, raise certain uh, uh, issues with respect to uh, the literature, the contemporary literature that is uh, taking place uh, in the, in the uh, current context of the world. The literature, as we all know, that uh, it, is the, it is the piece of uh, uh, law in one way which uh, not only documents, records, the kind of uh, uh, thinking patterns of uh, different people coming across the globe in, 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 in coming out with uh, their own thoughts, uh, their own uh, imagination, in a way, uh, the dreams uh, which uh, can come true at least on paper and sometimes uh, documenting certain historical events or sometimes going about uh, bringing about uh, social change or social reform through literature. So these kind of uh, different uh, prospects that we generally would like to look for in any kind of uh, literature. I'm sure Professor uh, Mukti with, uh, with uh, the given kind of uh, background that he is coming from, uh, having recognition across the globe as our executive director happened to uh, point out 
would be uh, focusing on the literature and its contribution in the contemporary world in not only documenting the contemporary issues with respect to the political ideologies, economic uh, policies, and more importantly, the kind of social change that it can bring about. As part of uh, this uh, uh, World Conference of uh, Social Sciences and Managements, when we would like to have uh, some uh, talk, some conclave, or some debate uh, from the background of literature, we generally expect that uh, the kind of literature that uh, we would like to have in the current context of uh, the world, especially aftermath of COVID, which has become uh, the new normal that we have to withstand and live with. I, I believe and I hope that uh, Professor Mukti uh, would be focusing the, uh, about uh, the kind of contribution that a literature will have in tackling, in dealing, and in withstanding the kind of a situation that, that we are actually living in. And at the same time, uh, the kind of contribution that the literature would have in, in, in management and as well as social sciences, especially in liberal arts for that matter. And, and uh, I'm sure that uh, not only from uh, India and Pakistan, but uh, from across the globe, uh, whoever is uh, going to listen to, uh, hear, or, or document uh, the current uh, conclave that we are all uh, uh, have become party to, will be uh, really uh, thinking in terms of uh, the kind of uh, contribution Professor Bhukti, personally, individually, as an author, as, as a professor of literature, has got uh, in, in, in his own contribution towards lit literature. So while uh, uh, acknowledging the uh, professor's, uh, Professor Mukti's uh, background and his contribution to the field of literature, and uh, I also would like to congratulate uh, Professor Mukti for uh, his achievement and congratulate uh, the Center for Adivasi Research and Development for bringing him on board uh, for today's uh, debate and deliberations. And I hope and believe that uh, we all from across the globe would uh, be benefited, uh, would be actually empowered to listen to Professor Mukti. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Srinivasulu. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Mufti to initiate his talk. Over to you, Professor Mufti. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the uh, introduction, very kind introductions, and for uh, inviting me to uh, speak uh, to your uh, uh, to your colleagues and your center. Um, I um, must admit I was not entirely aware of uh, what the ongoing context of exchange of ideas is uh, at the moment here. Um, so uh, I, I hope that my remarks will not be too um, uh, irrelevant or um, uh, something like that, but um, what I would like to do is talk a little bit, uh, share some ideas about the concept of world literature and the history of this concept and what I take to be some of the problems uh, in this concept uh, and problems that have to do with uh, the literatures of the global south uh, of the so-called developing world uh, and how the concept might need to be rethought if we, if we take um, if we take Global South literatures uh, as our main um, uh, uh, as our main case, as our main examples of uh, of, of literatures, uh, rather than the, rather than the literature of the North or the Western world, uh, and and so on, and then maybe in question and answer, I can try to um, uh, I can try to address any questions that might arise. Um, well, hopefully it'll be a discussion rather than questions and answers. Um, um, uh, uh, any other questions that may arise. So uh, let me begin by making a few remarks uh, about uh, the, the, the history of this concept uh, of world literature. Um, as is now fairly well known, the idea of world literature was first publicized in a number of Goethe's writings in the final years of his life. The great German playwright and poet and novelist of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. 
His first use of it is in a diary entry on January 15, 1827, and the earliest use reported by his follower, Johann Peter Eckermann, uh, dates to two weeks later, January 31, uh, 1827. Um, Goethe returned to it in a number of writings almost until his death in 1832. In the book, Conversations with Eckermann, uh, which is a recording of these conversations between him and his uh, young follower, uh, Johann Peter Eckermann, Goethe is said to have made the remark in the context of reporting to his companion that he had been recently reading a Chinese novel, uh, something that occurs that, that appears very strange to, to this young man. He has never heard of such a thing as a Chinese novel. He assumes that novel means uh, a European mode of writing. Um, while conceding Goethe's role in popularizing the word the German word Weltliteratur, world literature, we usually translate it as world literature, which subsequently spread like wildfire all, all over Europe in the early to mid 19th centuries. Uh, Theo Den has identified, uh, the, uh, uh, identified at least two earlier usages of the, of the term in German letters, the earliest dating to uh, 1773. So in any case, it's a, it's a concept that first emerges uh, in German um, literary culture and scholarship in the late 18th to early 19th uh, centuries. What Goethe actually says to Eckermann in that reported conversation is that, I quote, um, sorry, one second, please. What Goethe actually says to Ackermann uh, in that conversation is, I quote, national literature has not much meaning nowadays. The epoch of world literature is at hand and each must work to hasten its coming, unquote. This statement conveys three interrelated things, three things that are inter interrelated to each other. Number one, that national literature has become meaningless. The idea that literature is a national uh, uh, institution has become meaningless, uh, that something called world literature is now fast becoming a reality, a kind of literature imagined as a kind of borderless world, but that everyone must also work hard and commit to the task of bringing it about uh, sooner. The statement, in other words, contains a narrative about the transition away from romantic nationalisms and the role played by literature in the development of national cultures literature as a national institution. After the initial popularity of the idea uh, uh, in the mid 19th century, the um, uh, approach to literature, it signifies uh, this, this idea of, of literature as a world encompassing borderless reality. The approach to literature that it signifies has gone in and out of fashion to return with a vengeance in the new millennium, in our millennium. Uh, starting uh, in, in the late 1990s, uh, a whole series of, of uh, writings in the US in particular, and now under the influence of these scholars like Franco Moretti and uh, Pascal Casanova in France, uh, I think the idea has become really quite disseminated uh, worldwide. Um, after the initial popularity of the idea in the mid 19th century, the approach to literature it signifies has gone in and out of fashion to return with a vengeance in the new millennium. In uh, 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 Theo Dan's judgment, I quote, no other approach to literary studies has shown as spectacular a success in the new millennium, unquote. Um, and, you know, this success takes the form of uh, numerous uncountable, uh, really uncount, uh, un uh, numerous um, uh, edited volumes, uh, readers of world literature theory, read readers of world literature itself, that is to say, anthologies of literature that bring together selections of, of literature from across the world that have the ambition of encompassing the whole world and its many uh, literatures and so on. Uh, numerous conferences, uh, it's in the US certainly, uh, and I think also in parts of Europe, 
Uh, it's even become the description of uh, uh, for jobs in, in literature departments, in English departments even, and so on. So it's, it's quite a spectacular success that this concept has had in some parts of the world, certainly um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the last, let's say, 20 years or so. Um, how, how are we to understand the spectacular success of this concept in academic literary studies and in commercial publishing? over the last two decades. So this, this is the, one of the core questions that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm posing here and trying to suggest some very uh, initial answers to. As I've argued in my last book, uh, Forget English, uh, Orientalisms and World Literatures, the different versions of uh, world thinking in our times, as I call it, such as the notion of the borderless world, which is a very popular, very common concept now, if we think of uh, uh, even organizations like Doctor Without Borders uh, and things of that sort, it, it, the, the idea that the world is or ought to be a borderless world is after all a very, very common uh, and widely disseminated idea now. Uh, <clears throat> the different versions of world thinking in our times must be understood in terms of the world conjuncture, that is to say this historical moment within and from which they seek to conceptualize the world. What are the conditions of, of the world that make possible this world concept, that is world literature? The discourse on world literature appears to be really uninterested in, in uh, even posing this question. So my, in my work, I've been trying to pose this question, uh, which uh, uh, scholars, most scholars of world literature don't seem to me to be really interested in posing. It is far from coincidental that the latest, most extensive revival of the idea of world literature occurred precisely at, in the US at the cusp of the post-Cold War era and uh, alongside such other world concepts of that historical moment, also uh, originating in the US, such as the end of history and the clash of civilization. In the most widely disseminated versions of the concept of world literature, the central more or less explicitly stated claim is that literature or culture as a worldwide reality in our times has overcome the hierarchies, asymmetries, antagonisms and conflicts of colonialisms and nationalisms of earlier eras. <clears throat> And yet, ironically enough, any attempt to write the history of the idea of a global republic of letters and readers leads back precisely to the very era of the expansion of colonialisms and nationalisms in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The scene, as it were, of the birth of the idea that is presented in uh, uh, Goethe's conversations with Eckermann is an orientalist scene par excellence in Edward Said's sense of that word. Staging for the reader the work of Orientalism as a set of emergent philological practices in the transformation and rearrangement of humanistic knowledge in Europe and, and later America at the threshold of modernity. It is the work of Orientalists that has made the concept of world literature a possibility, a necessity, and an inevitability. Thus, at least at its inception, world literature is an eminently Orientalist idea. I think it is possible to identify four distinct extended moments in the history of this idea over the last almost 200, uh, uh, 200 years, around 200 years. First of all, of course, um, uh, Goethe's own era, that is, that is what the French historian Raymond Schwab called the Oriental Renaissance of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, that accompanied the consolidation of the modern colonial system with England as the dominant power after victory in the 200 year conflict and competition uh, with France. The second moment uh, in the history of the idea of world literature, uh, we could say is the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the period of European imperial decline and the rise of the US uh, as, a global, uh, as a global power. 
um, uh, and, and global industrial, uh, military and, and geopolitical power, military, of course, power that had to be called upon twice within a quarter century uh, to save uh, European society from itself in the, in the First and Second World Wars. Uh, the third moment in the history of this idea of world literature I'm suggesting would be the post-war era, the post-Second World War era, the aftermath of two European civil wars, genocide, end or impending end uh, of the European empires. And the great sort of thinkers of this moment of this idea are people like um, um, uh, Eric Auerbach uh, and Spitzer and Curtius, essentially German uh, uh, thinkers. And in the case of the first two German Jewish uh, exiles uh, outside of Germany in the 30s and 40s uh, and 50s. Uh, Fourth and finally, I would say, is our own extended moment uh, since the end of the Cold War. And here the main thinkers, among others, have been my own teacher, David Damrosch, uh, Franco Moretti, uh, Pascal Casanova, uh, the late Pascal Casanova in France, and so on. In other words, world literature is a humanistic concept that has emerged and returned repeatedly at key moments of the transformation of the structure of the global order over the last 200 years. So this concept is, is uh, in, in my thinking, inevitably linked to uh, the geopolitical world and um, uh, not uh, merely something that emerges uh, spontaneously from within a uh, self-contained, uh, let's say, Republic of Letters or literary world or something of that sort. It's really linked to world power, geopolitical power in fundamental ways. In a recent book, The World Makers, Global Imagination in Early Modern Europe, Aisha Ramachandran has de described the process of what she calls world making in the 16th and 17th centuries, the transformation of the European concept of the world in the aftermath of the so-called discovery uh, uh, by Europeans of the, of the so-called new world. Ramachandran's case studies uh, Mercato, Montaigne, Camus, Spencer, Descartes, and Milton are all part of this process for her of cultural readjustment and reorientation of Europe and world, and in producing a new, new European imagination of the world. The new practice of map making, uh, she argues, that, uh, and the new genre of the atlas that, that uh, was consolidated out of it, um, and out of and against such classical and medieval forms as the cosmography, uh, semi-mythical forms, sought to harness the massive increase of information about distant places that flooded into Europe in the midst of discovery, so-called genocidal war, conquest, commerce, and exploration in the 16th century, in the 1500s, as part of a wider attempt to get past the intellectual uncertainties and crisis precipitated by these developments, by these discoveries of faraway places and, and radically different modes of human life uh, on, on multiple continents and so on. Um, the argument is that it, that it created a kind of crisis within European culture uh, uh, that led to the collapse of the traditional uh, uh, world and, and world view and the, the emergence of early forms of, of modern culture. Uh, the French anthropologist uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss characterized these civilizational encounters between Europe and what became its various others uh, and consequent disruptions as, uh, within European culture as so profound and so decisive that nothing comparable could ever be expected in human history, he argued, unless and until the discovery of, of advanced life forms in outer space. However, Ramachandran ignores entirely uh, the reminder of Carl Schmitt, the uh, German legal thinker of the early to mid 20th century, in his uh, great work, The Nomos of the Earth, that as, as I, I quote him, the question was not a purely scientific mathematical, uh, uh, was not purely scientific, mathematical or scientific uh, one, but rather was political from the start, that is linked to the appropriation and division of the newly discovered lands, imagined to be free land, open for the taking. In other words, the early modern geographical imagination of the world as a whole is fundamentally linked to the European appropriation of land uh, again in, uh, uh, in, in four continents. Um, 
five continents, including Australia, of course, eventually. Uh, I wish to suggest that this currently influential form of one world thinking in the humanities, namely world literature, is implicated in its distinct way with respect to the question, uh, with respect to the question of the West or global North um, as concrete order and principle of structuring of the world or, and to be more precise, it is a question, it is a question its various versions confront or suppress to varying degrees. The question of a Eurocentric nomos of the earth, uh, Carl Schmitt's concept of a concrete order of the world as a ju juridical and political framework developed by the early colonial powers through a whole series of uh, uh, treaties and, and arrangements and so on, uh, a, a concrete structuring of the world. Uh, <clears throat> And to be, uh, to be precise, it is a question as various versions confront or suppress to varying degrees. The question of a Eurocentric nomos of the earth, uh, Carl Schmitt's conception of a concrete order of the world as a juridical and political framework, which in his account lasted from the early 16th century to the early 20th century, implies by extension cognate social, cultural, intellectual, and even psychic forms as well. In Schmidt's usage, a nomos of the earth is, I quote, a spatial, political, and juridical system that is mutually binding upon the various uh, colonial colonizing powers uh, and become a matter of tradition and custom, unquote. From the age of discoveries in, in the 16th and 17th centuries until the turn of the 20th century, the nomos of the earth was embodied in European public or international law Ius uh, publicum in Latin, Volkerrecht uh, in German, uh, formulated in the interactions of the emergent European states as they encountered each other on distant continents and out at sea. Schmitz is a theory of the European colonial system uh, that had ordered the world, that had structured the world over the course of four centuries. And something that, that we call America played a crucial role in both its emergence, which was caused by the European discovery of the so-called new world, and in the displacement of this order, in the overcoming of this order, when the US emerged as a major world power in its own right at the turn at the beginning of the 20th century. America had displaced the old Europe uh, and the United States of America now claimed to be the new Europe, the new and truer West. Uh, this is in Schmidt's uh, understanding of these historical developments. The so-called New World Order announced in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union with its vision of unhindered global trade and scaled down welfare states, uh, together with, with, um, uh, with multicultural logics of social belonging, is the historical conjuncture proper to understanding the concept of world literature, it seems to me, in our own times. Um, for Schmidt, the basic distinction was between European territories in the old European nomos of the earth, which America destroys uh, by its rise and dominance in the early 20th century, uh, and the formation of such things like the League of Nations and eventually the United Nations. Um, the basic distinction of, for Schmidt in the old European nomos of the earth or old European ordering structure of the earth uh, was between European territories belonging to one or the other of its constituent states and non-European spaces, the latter being treated as wild and open for appropriation. Uh, and as, he, as, no, as Schmidt uh, points out, the Greek word nomos itself contains the essential element of the world order that Schmidt Schmidt uses it to signify. I quote him again. First, nomos means appropriation. Second, it also means division and distribution of what is taken. And third, utilization, management, and usage of what has been obtained as a result of the division, that is production and consumption, unquote. As its translator G.L. Ullman has noted, I quote, belief in European civilization was essential to the whole structure of Volkerrecht, of international law in that sense, and was part and parcel of European consciousness, uh, unquote. 
World literature therefore first appeared as a concept in the, in the, in the post-Congress of Vienna, reconsolidation and restoration of the European system at home and abroad after the French revolutionary uh, Napoleonic uh, interruption uh, of that order. It, its appearance and reappearance has always been linked to shifts in the, in the world political order, in the structure of the nomos of the earth, we might say, moments of transition and transformation that raise anew the questions of uh, human diversity, civilizational identities, and local forms of expression in periods of renewed consolidation of the world. For Goethe, Weltliteratur, world literature, was fundamentally linked already to the European-dominated world economy, Weltwirtschaft, as he calls it, the world economy, each facilitating and enhancing the other. But aside from a descriptive impulse in Goethe's formulation, there is a normative one as well. The fairly explicit, explicit assumption is that the common world economy will lead slowly but surely to the realization of a common humanity. Schmidt's nomos does not merely provide useful ideas for an analysis, his book that is, uh, Nomos of the Earth, does not merely provide useful ideas for an analysis of the concept of world literature. Rather, it is relevant to such an analysis because it is um, uh, itself profoundly linked to the half millennium long history of European expansion, colonial conquests, and the building of empires. Excuse me just a second. According to Schmidt, this concrete, concrete order of the world was displaced by, and he uses the phrase concrete order, of course, uh, to contrast it with um, a US uh, centered or US dominated abstract notions uh, 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 that come to uh, abstract notions of human rights, for instance, and so on that come to structure uh, the practices of geopolitics in the form of the uh, uh, League of Nations and eventually the United Nations and so on. Uh, a concrete order rather than something based on supposed abstract universal concepts, um, a series of treaties, laws, uh, mutual agreements and arrangements between the various colonial powers and so on. This concrete order of the world was displaced by a universalism that emerged from the last decades of the 19th century and culminated in the aftermath of World War I in its most dangerous expression for Schmidt, namely the League of Nations. Uh, but this attempt to institutionalize a new nomos of the earth was, uh, Schmidt argues, bound to fail uh, because despite its supposed universalism and egalitarian, egalitarianism, it was not in fact homogeneous. Uh, for instance, it could not overcome the distinction between those who had won the war and those who were vanquished, armed states and unarmed states, so-called civilized and uncivilized, uh, and so on. Um, in other words, Smith's is a fundamentally conservative conception, of course, uh, uh, of geopolitics as opposed to uh, Wilsonian liberalism. Uh, uh, and the forms that it takes uh, early in the 20th century, for instance, in the, uh, uh, in, in the form of the League of Nations. Um, for Schmidt, it is hardly surprising that this decline of the European or, and Eurocentric nomos of the earth coincided with the rise of the US as a power, first in the Western hemisphere and then across the world. The US had erased such earlier geopolitical categories as civilized, half-civilized, and uncivilized nations, uh, categories that, that were, were essential elements in the European thinking about the rest of the world uh, and in European practices of, of uh, appropriation and, and so on, and competition between colonial powers. And, uh, sorry, excuse me. And the US had, had erased such earlier ge geopolitical categories as civilized, half civilized and uncivilized nations and distinguished now only between creditor and debtor nations. Uh, 
um, uh, this is uh, Schmidt again, viewing capitalist development as a, a so-called, as a universal project. Uh, Eric Auerbach, who helped establish comparative literary studies, not only in the US, but, um, uh, but also in, uh, also in Turkey, in fact, before the US uh, as a um, refugee emigre uh, scholar uh, helping to Europeanize and modernize the humanities uh, in, in, uh, uh, at Istanbul University and Turkish humanities more broadly. Uh, in other words, the, the, the modern sort of 20th century inventor or reinventor of the idea of world literature really uh, uh, invents it in Turkey, okay, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the conditions of um, Kemalist uh, Turkish Republican so-called modernization uh, of culture and society uh, and uh, uh, really uh, carries it with him to, to the U.S. Uh, in the 50s, in the fort, late 40s when he, uh, when he moves there. Um, uh, so, uh, so Arbach, who had helped establish comparative literary studies, not only in the US, but also in Turkey, challenged the basic assumptions of Goethe's humanism, that whole humanistic uh, heritage of the late 18th, early 19th century, especially in, in, in German culture, and, and exposed the concept of world literature, whose very basis is the key, is the idea, uh, it, whose very basis is the idea of human diversity, as being in fact part of the great engine of modernization and standardization that we call capitalism. Far from marking the overcoming of an earlier system of national differentiation, the idea and practices of world literature uh, arose precisely in the era of nation thinking. Um, <clears throat> and we might thus say that nationalism itself represents the standardization of human difference of the ways of being differently human. This, this brilliant idea in, uh, in, in Auerbach's uh, uh, writings of late, late in life writings of the late 40s and early 50s, he died in the mid 50s, um, uh, only about a decade after moving to the US. Uh, anyway, this very important idea that, um, uh, that nationalism is actually part of the modern industry of um, uh, of uh, uh, standardization of culture across the world. That is to say, what nationalism does uh, is that it universalizes the same way of being different, uh, uh, essentially, across vastly different forms of societies and civilizations uh, across the world. The descriptive normative tension is visible to varying degrees in the world literature discourse of our times as well, whose historical moment, properly speaking, is, as I have noted already, the end of the bipolar world uh, of the post-war era, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and all the various historical possibilities worldwide that it had embodied. And here, of course, um, uh, uh, we, we, we must recall the alternative conceptions of a liter literary international that the collapse of the Soviet Union have more or less removed from, um, uh, from our kind of collective memory in some ways really even. Uh, uh, and one of them of course was the socialist international um, uh, that, that covered not only the countries of Europe uh, Eastern Europe and Soviet Union and so on, but also large numbers of societies uh, in, 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 uh, in Asia, China, of course, in the early years uh, and so on. Uh, and then the somewhat different but overlapping conception of the post Bandung uh, moment and movement in which of course South Asian countries play a very significant role as well. The idea of a different kind of international than that being propounded uh, on the one hand by America, US led capitalism, and on the other by um, Soviet, -led, uh, Soviet led communism. Although as I have said, very often there's an overlap with the, with the Soviet uh, international uh, in these conceptions of, of uh, culture and literature. Uh, and uh, the journals associated with this movement, like Lotus, have disappeared. Uh, I mean, uh, really, it, it had a powerful presence in the progressive writers movement in South Asia, in, in the different countries of South Asia, for instance. Uh, and all that seems to have been, to some extent, to a great extent, erased, really, from historical memory. 
Uh, in some ways, there is a return now, a, a, a kind of return to the legacy of the Bandung movement. And I have myself been involved in a small way in that, uh, in co-directing a project called um, uh, Rethinking Bandung Humanisms. In any case, uh, part of what this American-led world literature concept and, and movement and practice does is that it erases from historical memory those earlier uh, alternative versions of the literary world. Okay. Um, sorry, let me repeat the sentence. The descriptive normative tension is visible to varying degrees in the world literature discourse of our times as well, whose historical moment, properly speaking, is the end of the bipolar world, the, the, the West and uh, the so-called communist East, uh, end of the bipolar world of the post-war era, collapse of the Soviet Union and all the various historical possibilities worldwide that it had embodied. And for the most part, it assumes a naturalized and non-political world space, uniform and, traver and traversable. This idea that the literary world is a world without borders and easily traversable and um, uh, kind of a uniform uh, continuous space rather than a discontinuous one. Even Franco Moretti and Pascal Casanova, who are interest, interested press precisely in the inequalities that structure the space uh, of literature as a world encompassing reality, render it as naturalized and depoliticized space divided between so called centers, peripheries, and semi peripheries. Borrowing largely wholesale the vocabulary of the world systems theory developed by the economic historian. Uh, uh, by the economic uh, historian Emmanuel Wallerstein. Uh, basic questions about the nature of the world, I'll, I'll round up now. Basic questions about the nature of the world that is referenced in the name. Uh, uh, how are centers, peripheries or semi-peripheries constituted in world tree space? What cultural logics are brought into play in that process of con constitution? How the very concept of world literature is situated within the historical conjunctures uh, in which it first emerged or arises again are left entirely unasked by these, uh, by these scholars. Um, thank you, I'll stop there now and, and, and we can maybe open up for um, Q&A and conversation. Dr. Jenna, are you there? Uh, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. B.C. Das to go for a quick comment. And Dr. B.C. Das. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your very, uh, I would like to congratulate from Prabhupada and also our host institutions. You rightly mentioned about many uh, global literature related to South Asian languages and other formalities as concerned in terms of uh, these ideas, how to relate uh, global order and uh, global disorder also. At the same time, I would like to ask you some very uh, brief questions. Uh, in what is your ideas about this political economy of the knowledge through test, particularly in 21st century world? 
Sorry, say that again. Knowledge through. Yeah. Uh, the political economy of knowledge. I'm sorry, you're breaking up. I can't hear you. Sir, are you listening to my question? I, I can't hear you. You're breaking up. Okay, okay, okay. It is your ideas on political economy of knowledge in 21st century's test. Well, uh, it's of course a very, very broad question. Uh, let me offer some uh, some thoughts uh, on that. Um, no knowledge is, of course, a world that is both deeply divided in various ways uh, and in many ways also uh, becoming accessible across those divisions, you know, through, um, I mean, what we are doing right now, a, a global event, a globally available event, certainly, uh, from uh, um, uh, uh, arranged by uh, an, uh, a center in, in uh, India. And here I am a speaker sitting in Massachusetts, um, sharing my thoughts and so on. So uh, 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 clearly there is a way in which, uh, um, uh, clearly there is a way in which um, uh, the new technologies uh, and the new media have made possible uh, dissemination of knowledge in certain ways that was not possible until very recently, even in my life and in my career. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to me that does not mean that we are in a kind of borderless world in the world of knowledge and scholarship and so on. Um, uh, there are there are certainly um, modes of knowledge production that remain dominant in various ways to a certain extent and so on. Uh, and you know one of the things is that uh, one of the things is that the um, uh, a, 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 a knowledge concept like world literature, uh, in fact, uh, uh, encourages and normalizes notions of national tradition. Okay, this is one of the great contradictions to me in the concept of world literature. Uh, that, that far from overcoming the idea of national particularities, it in fact uh, uh, does the reverse. It, it, it in fact normalizes some conception of national traditions and views world literature itself as a kind of coming together or conversation between, uh, between these distinct traditions. Uh, and of course, what that does is, uh, it, 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 what, what that does is it takes certain practices within the societies that, that it takes under its purview, and it normalizes them as the national tradition. This is what happened in the 19th century in South Asia. Uh, as a certain uh, Sanskrit-based Brahmanical culture became uh, the normative conception of, an, of, of Indian civilization and so on. And on the other hand, a kind of Arabic Persian-based uh, 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 or influenced culture became somehow the normative form of uh, Muslim culture in South Asia, right? So I think processes like that are still at work in some ways. Um, uh, we have not quite overcome that, despite the uh, uh, despite the um, real changes that have taken place as a result of uh, of, of the new technologies and social media and so on. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your very. Today's weather is hazy clouds, camera. twenty degrees Celsius in Bajabati. And particular, sir, when you talked about this literature, I want to know. What is the difference between the comparative literature and the uh, contemporary literature? And contemporary literature, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, comparative literature is, of course, the basic idea in comparative literature is that, that no literature can really be understood on its own terms 
uh, on its internal, uh, no culture really can be understood on its own internal terms and internal assumptions, but always in comparison with others. That is to say, always by undermining uh, the sense that many cultures have and many literary traditions have of having a unique and distinctive life of their own, okay? Uh, that does not, uh, in order to understand which, it does not require us to reference any other culture, any other alien uh, tradition and so on. So uh, comparative literature works against that, uh, that argument. It works against the argument that um, uh, cultural traditions are coherent internally in their own terms uh, and must be understood only according to internal criteria and so on. Uh, but rather that they should always be put in, in uh, comparison with each other, in, in contact with each other, in order to displace their own sense of uh, uniqueness and certainty about themselves. Uh, contemporary literature is mainly a chronological term, of course, uh, but, <laughs> you know, interestingly, it's a, it's a chronological term. It's not like saying 19th century literature or 20th century literature, because the contemporary changes always, of course, right? So when you said contemporary literature in the 1960s, that meant something very different from what we mean by contemporary literature today. Uh, but in, in any case, I see it, I see it as, as very much part of comparative literature as a discipline. Um, I see it as part of the purview uh, of comparative literature as a discipline, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I, I would like to know more about this particular capitalist approach of packaging new ideas in terms of literature. You rightly mentioned about when you talked about South Asian language or South Asian literature, in particular in terms of our Arabic literature or many other literature, those have been not very taken up, taken for granted or very taking seriously, particular these Eurocentric notions and this Americanization of perspective. So how would like this particular sense of notion when we try to devastating someone's culture over the period of so many decades and so many centuries, then we have to find a serious vernacular literature when vernacular literature is devastating by this capitalistic approach, how you feel and what kind of your observation through your literature perspective research, how do you feel the uh, global impact on these vernacular literatures? Yes, well, that's a very important question I've written. I, I've, I mean, I think it's a very important question. I've written a book about it, uh, my last book called Forget English. Um, um, and the, you know, what, what I would say is that if we look at the history of, of uh, literature globally over the last, let's say, 200 years, from the time of Goethe, you know, late 18th, early 19th century, uh, it's, it's a process of extraordinary assimilation, right, of writing traditions and oral traditions uh, from across the world, radically different from each other uh, and so on. Uh, and it's it's a, a process of assimilating them all into some uh, very European Western conception of what is literature uh, and and what is its, what is the relationship of literature to let's say society to politics and so on and so forth. So it's a great process of uh, of assimilation and even the vernacular traditions, let's say, you know, I, I, in South Asia, I know only uh, Urdu and Hindi and a little bit of Punjabi. Um, so my knowledge is limited, and my direct knowledge is limited in South Asia to those uh, literary traditions. Uh, uh, Urdu and Hindi, of course, come into being. They come into being as distinct languages precisely by coming into contact with Western notions of literature and Western notions of language and literature and people and so on, namely very nationalistic ideas. Uh, so um, uh, my, my own understanding is really that, that in fact, the, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the entire history of, uh, uh, of, of literature in large parts of the Northern subcontinent certainly are deeply impacted by uh, colonial uh, knowledge, uh, colonial conceptions, and so on, through education, of course, gradually in the course of the 19th century, and so on. Um, 
so uh, um, vernacular literatures are not necessarily uh, free of the influence of the European and Eurocentric impact. This is my point. Uh, and uh, but on the other hand, it seems to me that 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 the great struggle in the vernacular languages is precisely to uh, create modes of imagination uh, and representation and so on that are not entirely Eurocentric in that sense. Okay. Um, um, as for English, you know, at least um, globally speaking. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, when when people in the West talk about Indian literature now, very often they mean English language literature. Okay, they mean uh, uh, Salman Rushdie and his children, as it were. Um, and uh, in 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 departments of English in America, for instance, this new concept of Anglophone literature is is seen as a concept that is to say literature written in, in English, not in uh, the US and, and the UK, but in the rest of the world. Uh, it's a very strange concept because what it, what it means to do is to, is to celebrate a kind of diversity of, of English uh, literary creativity, okay? But in my, as I see it actually, uh, it's a concept uh, that in fact conceals the reverse process which is this extraordinary assimilation of non-Western imaginations, non-Western uh, global South societies and cultures and so on into uh, a literary imagination uh, that is fundamentally uh, Western and Eurocentric still. Uh, so it's a, I, th I think you are right to raise the question of the vernacular literatures, but what I would say is that we have to be careful not to not to assign or ascribe to vernacular languages and literatures uh, some conception of complete autonomy from the colonial process, from the process of Eurocentric domination in the colonial period and the post-colonial period. Um, so the vernaculars, the, the vernaculars have, you know, there are there are children of Macaulay in the vernacular literatures as well, not just in the English uh, language literature. Okay, that's how I would put it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind information. And uh, I would like to uh, know your ideas because, sir, you are a very fantastic brain of the globe related to literature. Uh, what is your observation, sir? What do you thinking about this IT, ICT revolution, information, communication, and technology in the era of uh, post-globalization world? When we... Uh, almost seen the picture of what happened in this particular global south perspective the order is collapsed and the language and literature both are in problematic uh, and pain sides of these uh, even the, the quote unquote voice puberty also one of the major crisis for all these regions because always in terms of you know sir we are representing a country which have 29 states and multicultural uh, approaches of multilinguistic country what would you say and what is your observation to preserve our nature, culture, language, and literature in terms of media, society, and culture? Yes, that's uh, also a very different question, a very difficult question, uh, of course. Uh, and um, I am I am not necessarily the best person to talk to about uh, uh, about technology and media and so on. It's not a field of uh, my specialization, really, in any way. Uh, uh, but uh, again, I would say we have to be very skeptical because yes, of course, the whole technological revolution of the last 20 years have opened up really pretty remarkable possibilities. Uh, and uh, in some ways has made difficult to, to, to uh, has made it easier to overcome uh, the whole supposed division between centers and peripheries and so on, okay? Uh, so uh, there's no doubt that that those are uh, those are th those are the sort of positive uh, changes um, brought about to world culture and world society and so on uh, by uh, by the technology revolution of the last few decades. On the other hand, I think we have to be skeptical because this process is also part. You know, it's a continuation of capitalist 
integration of the world. So we have to be really skeptical about, uh, 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 we have to be very careful in, in not simply seeing uh, technology as a universal cure for something or a panacea for something. Uh, in fact, it will accelerate some of the problems that already existed, for instance, for vernacular languages and, and uh, literatures. I mean, now, of course, uh, not only uh, the, the, the uh, sort of regional languages, for instance, in South Asia, but the national languages themselves are under threat uh, from English uh, uh, because of the role that English plays uh, on the social media. I mean, our writing systems are disappearing in some ways. I don't want to exaggerate, but you know, the use of the Roman script to write uh, South Asian languages on social media and so on uh, is is a is a you know pretty dramatic new development. And uh, I can imagine a situation where more and more young people will, in fact. Uh, uh, um, to the extent that they know their vernac vernacular languages, uh, will be writing them in Roman script in some very imprecise way. Um, so I, I, I think that educationists, uh, you know, in, in schools, uh, in colleges and universities and so on at every level, uh, have to take very seriously uh, a critique of the technology revolution as well. Okay, not merely it's um, uh, not merely a, a kind of uncritical celebration of the many things that it also many good things, positive things that it also has made possible, which I don't deny. So we need we need some a strong sense of a kind of skepticism about the technology revolution. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now, I'd like to request uh, Professor Rudranand Das to uh, go for a formal vote of thanks. And thank you so much, sir, for connecting all the way from USA and talked very uh, thematic, uh, sincere, and very informative related to nomos of global literature. And thank it's, you. It's really very energetic, sir, and very informative. It's, very, it's my you. pleasure. It's a real pleasure for me. Thank you for asking me. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mufti. On behalf of Center of Adivasi Research and Development, uh, I take this opportunity to purpose the vote of thanks uh, to those who have directly Sorry for the interruption. Uh, those for, uh, <clears throat> who directly or indirectly contributed to World Human Sciences and Management Conference 2021. At the outset, uh, I thank our guest speaker, Professor Amir Mufti. Uh, we are really enlightened uh, with your deliverance uh, on the nomos of world literature and theorizing uh, it uh, in a uh, liquid manner. Uh, we are uh, thankful to our coordinating institutions, Indian Institute of Management, Sambalpur, Central University of Odisha, Korapur, and Ravenso University, Kotak, for their support uh, to organize this virtual event. I would like to thank uh, Professor Sanjay Nayak, Professor S.K. Palita, Professor Dr. Mahadev Jaiswal, Dr. Vikram Jena, I'd like to thank our conveners of this conference, Professor C.P. Nanda and uh, Professor Charudat Panigrahi for their motivation and guidance. A special thanks uh, to the organizing committee members, Professor Srinivasulu Enes, Dr. Sudarshan Misra, Professor Lokunath Misra, Professor B.C. Das, Professor Sobhan Bhag, Dr. Nupur Patnaik, Dr. Amula Acharya, uh, Subham Das, Chinma Sahu, Dr. Kamal Prasad Mahanti, Dr. Samuel Lima, Dr. Neha Sarma for their un, unflinching support and coordination. Our heartfelt thanks to all the academicians, researchers, scholars, and students for their active participation. With these warm words and a kind message, uh, we move to the to, to end of the session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, our participants, to join us.
thank you professor mufti thank you thank you very much thank you sir and looking forward for future engagement also sir thank you yes. thank you so I, much thank you me too bye bye thank you